Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to the Truth. It's a blessing and a privilege to be back in your presence once again. I pray as we enter into another new week once that God has smiled on you and that this message finds you doing well. I'm excited as always. We come back to the house of the Lord to look at his word. I have to tell you, this particular passage of scripture and all of the study that God has sent me through to get to this place has challenged me. It has challenged me. It has challenged me. It has challenged me. Um, I'm always going through self-assessment with God in Patrick's life. Where is Patrick's walk? How is Patrick's walk? Where is he? His mind is at, you know, am I being what you've called me to be? Am I useful to you in your service? This is kind of the, the assessment that Patrick does. And um, one of the things is, is, is this, is that when I'm looking at life and I see life going about and I'm experiencing it, I'm always questioning, especially when I see someone or someone refers to themselves as a Christian or the church and they do something that doesn't look like the church. That always causes me palpitations, you know, right? And, um, and so here's the thing, is, is, is probably the reason why he has me here in this particular passage of scripture. Um, I'm really critical of preachers and teachers, pastors, because we're entrusted with the souls that belong to God. Amen. So therefore, if you're not preaching and teaching the full counsel of God's word, I've got issues. Because where you leave room for error, error leads to damnation. Mm-hmm. Amen. Come on, that's making it plain, right? And so, but the issue ex- should extend beyond just the pulpit. Anybody that is a, says they're a person of the faith or they're Christian or whatever, and they are claiming to be teaching you something or showing, revealing something to you, and it is an error but yet you believe them because you like them. There is a problem with that because it still leads to damnation. And you got to be able to speak truth to people that you like and also to people you don't like. Truth. And so when I was thinking about this, I was asking God, so then how do you do it? So he takes me to scripture and he shows me Paul when he was speaking to Agrippa Agrippa was holding his life in his hands. And Paul spoke truth to power. Mm-hmm. Agrippa said to him, in a, in a short while, you almost, almost convinced me to become Christian. In a short while. But he spoke truth to him. And that was power. Mm-hmm. Right? So then I went on beyond that point. And next thing you know, God's got me over here. I'm in John. And I'm reading. And I come across John 18, verse 37 to 38. This is when Jesus had been betrayed by the Jews, okay? And they bring him in, and they bring him before Pilate. And this picks up the conversation where Pilate says, they're telling Pilate that he was a, he's a king, he calls himself the king of the Jews. Verse 37 says this. He says, so you're a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Y'all might want to underline that in your Bible. Everyone on the side of truth, it's his truth. Not my personal feelings of truth, not my, 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 my goal or my ambitions of truth, his truth listens to him. And then Pilate says these words in verse 38. What is truth? And he retorted, and then with, with Pilate, and then with this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Jesus spoke truth to him, and the man couldn't find any reason to hold him. Mm-hmm. But out of fear of his position, right. of the people, he handed him over to be crucified. But I got to give you one more piece. John chapter 19, verses 7 to 11. This is Jesus speaking truth to power. It says the Jewish leaders insisted we have a law and according to the law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. Verse eight. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. Now y'all get this now. He was afraid beforehand. Back in 18, chapter 18, he was already afraid. But now he hears this piece here in chapter 19 and it says now he's even more afraid. 
And he went back inside the palace and he says to Jesus, where do you come from? And he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. And then verse 10 says this. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have power to either to free you or to crucify you? Now he's telling Jesus he's got power because he was in a position from an earthly perspective of power. Verse 11, Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Mm -hmm. Speaking truth mm -hmm. to power. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Now, see, Pilate, you sinned, but the ones who handed me over to you is of a greater sin. Speaking truth to power. Truth, his truth, is always the truth. So whenever you squirrel away in your little secret closets or whatever you do with your, on social media and so forth, and you don't align with truth, but you align with the truth of who you are in Jesus name, that's a problem. Because see, I want you to realize there's a real ending for people who are false teachers and preachers and leaders of the people. There's a real ending and it's not a good one. And so I'm sharing this now because I had to get that out there because, see, you're going to find the, 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 the responses and the ending for those kind of people in our message this morning. Because it's about growing in Christ, becoming Christ-like. And so Paul, who we love the book, I love the book of Philippians personally, because it's the book of joy. It's the book of joy. He's always talking, my joy is over, uh, my joy this, right? And it's beautiful. But in this particular passage from 17 to 21, I find him doing some of the greatest teaching about how to be Christian. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you would turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, starting at the 17th verse, say amen when you have it, if not, so wait on me. Philippians chapter 3, starting at the 17th verse. Amen? Amen. And it reads this way. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I often told you now and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Stop. They are enemies. So anyone is giving you false, not true of the cross of Christ is the enemy. Are you getting it? Verse 19. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, this is your poor, weak, and unworthy servant coming humbly before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply say thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for another opportunity to stand and be you in your service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hour has come where your people have gathered themselves together once again to hear from on high. So, Master, as your servant stands this morning, I pray for preaching power. To fill me afresh and new with your Holy Spirit, and that you would bless me to be able to rightly divide your word of truth before them. And, Father God, you are our master and our savior and our redeemer, and we'll be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And it's your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen, amen. and amen. This morning's title is called Reaching for the Prize, Part 2, The Process. Reaching for the prize, part two, the process. And at the top of your outline, you will find the words goal of salvation. It says the goal of salvation is for believers to be conformed to the image of God's son. That's Romans 8, 29. I know you all hear me say that often, but I want you to know that's a biblical perspective and principle and goal, period. Not just my words. And so I just want to welcome you once again this morning. Last week, we shared in our little mini-series, we covered the first part of reaching for the prize, the prerequisites, right? And Paul identified in verses 12 to 16, six prerequisites 
we needed to have if we were to reach the prize. And he started out this way. The first one was this. He says that we need to have a proper awareness of our spiritual condition. And what he means by that is that we must assess our need to continue to grow. Because, see, if you are complacent or if you are com comfortable with where you are spiritually, you're in trouble. And then secondly, he says that we need to put in a maximum effort into growing in Christ. And, and he says it this way in verse 12. He says, but I press on. That's his maximum effort. I'm giving it everything I got, right? And then thirdly, he says that we are to have a focused concentration on Christ. And what he means by a focused concentration on Christ is this, is that maximum effort without focus is useless. You ever seen somebody do something with all their effort and it never accomplished anything because it, it was going in so many different directions? They didn't have a focus. So he's saying maximum effort. Effort without focus is useless. So have a focused concentration on growing in Christ. The fourth one is this. Was a proper motivation, which is the prize of Christ Jesus. To be like Christ, that is the prize. And then the fifth is this, was a proper recognition. And what he says, a proper recognition, what he means is that we are to acknowledge that we are not alone in this race by ourselves. Other Christians are in this same race with us. Amen? Amen. And so then the sixth one is this, is a proper conformity. And let me explain it to you when he says proper conformity, meaning that we are to live a consistent life in Christ. Somebody should say something. And so that becomes the key because, see, that's the foundation upon all these things will be built on. Is, your, is there a consistent conformity in your life? Growing toward Christ. Because, see, these are prerequisites. Before you can take the real class, you got to have the pre take the prerequisites, right? So now you've got the prerequisites under your belt. Now you're ready to sign up for the process. That's the class. And so now this morning, before Paul walks us through the process on reaching the prize, I must take you back to the basic truths of Christianity. The goal of Christianity and Christian living is not a believer's satisfaction, but God's satisfaction. Come on now. Come on. Because we keep thinking it's about us. The Christian life is a process of pursuing Christ's likeness, period. Stop. Drop the mic. Walk away. Close the curtains. See, Jesus himself repeated the command, follow me, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 19. He said it again in Matthew chapter 8, verse 22. He said it again in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. He says it again in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. And then he says it one more time in Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. He says it over and over and over and over, right? And so in this, is, in this command has not been replaced or improved upon. Follow me. Imitate me. Become like me. See, it is the most basic obligation of a believer. Paul expressed the same truth to the Galatians when he says this in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. He says, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is what? Formed in you. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. And so then, and then to the Corinthians, Paul says, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. So once again, there's the command. These are not optional pieces. And when Paul told the Philippians, the one thing I do, he reduced the Christian life to that one objective is to grow into Christ's likeness. The one thing I do, he took it all and rolled it into that one perspective. Wow. You see, when we evangelize the lost, when we are imitating the Lord who came to seek and save that which is lost, and as we mature spiritually, we grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See, when we die to sin and live to righteousness, see, we become more and more like Jesus Christ who knew no sin. Do you understand that those are the stepping stones to getting there? But see, this is the question this morning. How is this going to happen? How does it happen for us? Well, two things. 
There is an objective and a subjective source. Objective and subjective source for pursuing the prize of Christ's likeness. The objective source is the word of God. Amen. Oh my. Mm. And see, if we're going to become like Christ, we have to know what Christ was like. Amen? Amen. And so if we want to know what Christ was and is like, then where do we go? We go to the word. Here's why we go to the word. And you go to the whole word. Are y'all getting this? And here's why. Because this is the revelation of Christ. The Old Testament sets the scene for him. It teaches us and it creates the need for him. And it announces that he is coming. And then the Gospels record his arrival. The book of Acts records the immediate impact of that arrival. The epistles outlines the significance of his life and his ministry. The book of Revelation talks about the totality of his accomplishments. Do you understand that this is all a focus on Christ from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament? This is the mind of Christ. This is who you say we are to be like. You have his whole mind. You have all about him. You see, so when we study the word of God, we study in order that we might know what Christ is like so we can apply it to our life. Amen? Amen. And the subjective element is the work of the Holy Spirit. So we are also dependent on the work of the Holy Spirit to change us into the image of Christ. Because so you put the word in and the word and the Holy Spirit comes along and works with that word on your will and your desire. Hmm. Paul shares in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, these words. He says, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. So he's saying as you grow in this, the spirit is changing you, growing you closer and closer into a Christ likeness. See, here's the key. We are to let the word of God dwell richly in us and then let the spirit of God shape us into the image of Christ. Somebody should say something. But now, as we look at verse 17, Paul wants to get practical this morning. He is suggesting that there are three necessary elements in our pursuit that will help enhance us as we reach for the prize. Listen to what he says in verse 17a. This is the first one. He says, brethren, Join in following my example. So for the third time, Paul affectionately addresses the Philippians as brethren. He loved them. And they are brothers and sisters in Christ. Brethren. The phrase, join in, the fo in following my example, literally reads this way in the Greek. Be fellow imitators with me. See, most of the time we tell people, don't look at me, look at God. He said, mm -mm -mm, look at me. Be fellow imitators with me. We don't get the cop out today. And I mean, I, I just love this because, see, Paul urged the Philippians to imitate the way he lived. You remember, he's the same person who said he was the chief of sinners. But God. Okay? Now listen to this. He is not putting himself on a pedestal of spiritual perfection. In verses 12 through 16, he was already very clear that he had not achieved spiritual perfection. Amen? Amen. And so instead, he was now encouraging the Philippians to follow him, an imperfect sinner, as he pursued the goal of Christ-likeness. Somebody to say something. Because here's the key. We need to follow a Paul who is not perfect so we can see how to overcome our imperfections. Somebody needs to say something. Someone who ha can show us how to handle the struggles of life, the disappointments of life, the trials and tribulations of life, because he's been through it. Someone who can show us how to handle pride. Oh, my God. 
and how to handle and resist temptation and to put sin to death. We needed a good example. See, here's the deal. Christ is the perfect standard and model and pattern for believers to emulate, but Christ never pursued perfection. He has always been perfect. Amen. And that's oftentimes our cop out. I can't be like Christ. I'm not perfect. Hmm. And Paul, as a fellow traveler on the path toward the unattainable spiritual perfection, tells us to follow him. And thus, he became a model for believers to follow. Here's why. I'm going to give you just a few attributes from his life. He modeled virtue. He modeled morality. He modeled overcoming the flesh. He modeled victory over temptation. He modeled worship. He modeled service to God. He modeled patient endurance of suffering. He modeled handling possessions. And he modeled handling relationships. Somebody needs to say something. Is that not someone you can follow now? You see, it's, it's in verse 17b that Paul commanded the Philippians to observe those who walk accordingly. This is what it says. And observe those who walk accordingly to the pattern you have in us. This is a key piece. You might want to underline this in your Bible. Maybe highlight it. Because, see, when Paul says observe, it can be translated as fix your gaze on. Lock your, lie, your eyes on these people. Paul is, in effect, saying focus on those whose daily walk is according to the correct pattern. Oh, my goodness. Are y'all getting this? He says the ones you have in us. And when he says the ones you have in us, this is what he's speaking about. He is including Timothy and Epaphroditus, whom the Philippians knew, as well as the overseers and the deacons at Philippi. So no one gets out of this deal. If you claim the faith, then you have, people should be able to look at your life and walk. Oh, my goodness. Well, we're going to say, well, I'm, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners saved by grace. I'm not perfect. None of us are. So all your excuses is going away. Because we're called to grow. And as we grow in Christ, our life and walk gets better. Amen. Amen. You see, Paul's example was available to the Philippians in print as it is for us today. But they had also observed Paul's life firsthand during his stay at Philippi. So believers have always needed examples of godly lives as patterns. Amen. Amen. See, when you want to raise godly children, put godly parents in front of them. That's the best opportunity you will have to start to write, earn that right to write on their heart the truth of God's word. See, it's a hard hustle to try to have ungodly parents in front of children and expect the children to turn out to be godly. That just doesn't work. That's kind of like putting the cart before the horse, huh? But put in front of them an example of something that way they can see it every single day in every circumstances of life. When they were doing good, when they're doing bad, when they're being taught, when they're being having fun, put that type of example in front of them that honors God in all things. And that starts to write on their character, the truth of this word, earning that right to write on their heart. And so here's the deal. Those examples should be our pastors, our elders of the church, the church members. But I'm going to focus right now on the pastors and the elders real quick. You see, and this hits me hard. See, we are to show ourselves to be examples for those who believe. That's 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, by the way. By modeling humility and unselfish service, willingness to suffer, devotion to Christ, courage, and the dedication to spiritual growth. I'm supposed to be that type of model, even when I don't feel like it. The bar is high, but I don't get to shrink back from it. 
You see, those who teach and preach the word must handle it accurately. That is especially important today. And that is the area where my heart cries out the most. See, when the correct interpretation of scripture has been hopelessly blurred and seemingly any view is tolerated. That's a problem. Paul echoed Timothy's exhorted Timothy this way and said this in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. He says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Isn't that beautiful? That is one of those scriptures that just is etched into me because every time I approach the word, whether to preach it or to teach it, I am worried about my audience and my audience is always God. You just happen to be there. But accurate teaching of the truth must be backed up by a godly life. Somebody Amen. needs to say something. Because there should be congruence in what I say mm -hmm. and also how I live. And so it's in verse 18, Paul goes on to give, uh, tell us this morning to flee from the example of the enemies of the cross. Do you realize how many times that, that the word enemy is in there in regards to the, the people in the cross? This, this blesses me because, see, here's the thing. We don't want to think about those people who are just giving us a little bit of lie as an enemy. But we've read in the scriptures where it says a little bit of laven. He's talking about sin. Laven's the whole lump. Eventually, it will it'll get the whole body. But listen to what he says. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. And so the apostle also warned that in pursuing the spiritual prize of Christ likeness, it must be recognized that there are many examples to be avoided. Somebody needs to say something. Not everyone claiming Lord, Lord is of the Lord. And you've got to be able to discern it. You've got to be able to speak truth to it. And you've got to be able to pull yourself away from it and not be found associated with it. Period. Because here's why. The enemies of which Paul warns us about do not appear to have been openly hostile to the Christian faith. That's the worst kind of enemy that looks like a friend. The worst kind. And so, like their master Satan, they were deceptive, disguising themselves as messengers of Christ. Angels of light and servants of righteousness. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 to 15. Paul writes these words. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. Verse 14. And no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. You see, here's the deal. They became part of the church, possibly even in leadership roles. And their subtlety made them exceptionally dangerous to the body of Christ. They were kind. They were nice. They were gentle. They, they, they complimented you and did all these wonderful things and then fed you lies. But because they made you feel good or they agreed with a perspective or something that you had that was your own, that had nothing to do with God. And they agreed with it and you reveled in it. You trusted them. You see, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warned, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. That's Matthew 7, 15. And then he went on the Mount of Olivet discourse and he added this. See to it that no one misleads you for many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and will mislead many. That right there is Matthew 24 verses 4 through 5. But here's the big one. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, it teaches us, it says, to try the Spirit by the Spirit. Most of us don't even know what that means. Hmm. Sadly, because of half-heartedness toward the truth and shallow biblical knowledge, the church today lacks discernment. Somebody should say something. Because of half-heartedness toward the truth, and shallow biblical knowledge, the church today lacks discernment. See, it's astonishing and disturbing to see the things that Christians believe in the people they follow. Somebody needs to say something. You see, a lack of consistent and long-term, precise biblical exposition 
from the pulpit has led to a lack of biblical thinking and discernment. Mm -hmm. I put it where it belongs here. Mm -hmm. But also God puts it on you because he says, study to show thyself approved. <sighs> you see, this tragic result is the widespread victimization of the church by the enemies of the cross of Christ. Y'all get this? Widespread victimization of the church by the enemies of the cross of Christ. Do you, can you imagine being labeled as the enemy of the cross of Christ? Paul warned the Philippians that false teachers are enemies of the cross of Christ, but he didn't do it with gladness. He did it with tears. Why do you think he's crying? Yes. Because he wanted the enemies to be saved too. And here's the worst part of it. The enemy is going to lead others astray and they're going to go to hell. This brings on more tears because more souls are lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, if you just be honest with yourself and you look around in your daily life and the things that you do, the places you go, the social media stuff you do and so forth, your DNA is part of that. And if you're, that's just all bad, especially if it's not true. If it's not growing and edifying the kingdom of God, you got to let that stuff go, especially if you say you're his, because it comes with a punishment. <sighs> See, he says this. Here's the deal. Paul didn't label the specific enemies of the cross. They could have been Judaizers or Gentiles. We all know what that Judaizers argued circumcision was required to be saved along with faith in Christ. That was their issue, right? But then there was these Gentile heretics who were the forerunners of the second century Gnostics. They taught that spirit was good and the body and the flesh was evil. And they believed you could do anything you wanted in the flesh because the body was incurably evil and it did not affect the spirit. Yeah. See, it's funny that the Judaizers added to the gospel and the Gentile false teachers subtracted from it. The issue is this. Both are deadly wrong. And so it's in verse 19 that Paul uh, shares that there are four marks against the enemies of the cross. He says this, whose end is destruction. That's 19a. He says whose end is destruction. So Paul tells us that the false teachers and preachers, having rejected the one and only truth of salvation, the cross of Christ, all false teachers face the same fate. Their end. That word end in the Greek literally is telos, T-E-L-O-S. It refers to their ultimate destiny will be eternal destruction, torment, and punishment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 says this, They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. Do you understand that, that there's a consequence to this false teaching and false... See, we love, it. we love it when it's the preacher and the teacher and so forth, but it's us. It's us. You don't realize that when you share something that you know is not really true, you're teaching something. You just now became a teacher. When you're passing along something that you know is hateful and not right and destructive, you're guilty of that. That's you. I just want to make it really plain because, see, the only way the church comes out is the only way the church gets to be what the church called it to be is for us to be like what God called the church to be. And so here's the thing. The Judaizers deserve this fate because they added human works to the cross of Christ. The Gentile heretics deserve the same fate because they stripped the cross of Christ of its power to transform lives. Somebody should say something. You see, if you tell people that you don't have to change the flesh, then what is, what's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? See what I'm saying? Because they stripped the cross of its power to transform lives. And it's in 19b that Paul tells us that they serve the wrong God as well. He says, whose God is their appetite. Now, depending on your translation of your Bible, it might say stomach, mm -hmm. belly, okay? 
So Paul uses the metaphor, their appetite of the stomach. So he is referring to their unrestrained, sensual, fleshly, and bodily desires. This became their God. I do what I want to do. 1 Corinthians 6.13 says this, Food is for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. See, false, the false teachers were condemned because they did not worship God. They bowed down to their own sensual impulses. You see, I'm talking about reaching for the prize, which is the process this morning, right? But you see, and it's not, it's not enough that they, they did that, that they glorified also in their shame. That's another part of it. Verse 19c says this, whose glory is in their shame. And so Paul tells us that the false teachers boasted in the very things that brought them Shame. See, this is the most extreme form of wickedness when the sinner's most wretched conduct before God is, their, is his highest point of self-exaltation. The Judaizers boasted in their religious credentials and human achievements, right? The Gentile false teachers also boasted of their su supposed freedom to pursue sensual desires. They were the most proud of their worst perversions. Isn't that interesting? That's us. That's us. You see, it's in verse 19 that we see that they had no problem showing us where their heart is. And it says this, who set their minds on earthly things. Where are Christians supposed to put our minds? Heavenly, Right? And so it says th their earthly focus offers evidence that their false teachers were not saved. So in James chapter four, verse four, James asked the question, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. But it gets even better. If you look over in first John chapter two, verse 15, it says this. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. You see, the Judaizers focused on ceremonies and festivals and feasts and sacrifices and new moons, things which really did not matter. The Gentile false teachers focused on sensual pleasures of the world. And so the enemies of the cross, whether they added to the gospel or took away from it, are to be avoided at all times and never imitated for their end is destruction. <sighs> see, I grew up where... My grandmother taught me that if you were hanging out with somebody and they were in tr get, or getting into trouble, she says that you're guilty by association. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. You see, you didn't get the grade on a curve on that. Mm -hmm. Same thing. You see, it's in verse 28 that Paul now tells the Philippians to focus on their expectations. He says this, for our citizenship is in heaven. See, Paul tells us as believers, we are to have a heavenly focus because our citizenship is in heaven. And when he says citizenship, this is a key word because citizenship, it refers to the place where we have our official status. The country where our name is recorded on the register of citizens. Guess what, Sean? You're a citizen of heaven and it's registered in there. And so even though we live in this world, Christians are citizens of heaven and we are members of Christ's kingdom, which is not of this world. And we are and our names are recorded in heaven. Luke 10, 20 says this. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Come on now. See, our Savior is there, by the way. And also our fellow saints are going to be there. And our inheritance is there. And our reward is there. And our treasure is there. Though we do not yet live in heaven yet, we live in the heavenly realm. Somebody needs to say something. For Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 60, these words, he says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And so with that being said, we experience to some degree the heavenly life on earth now. Somebody needs to say something. Because here's why. We have the life of God within us and we are under the rule of heaven's king and live for heaven's cause. Somebody needs to say something. And it's in verse 20b that Paul tells us it is from heaven we eagerly look for our Savior. 
He says this, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. He's saying eagerly wait because this is how we should not be found. We are not to wait for Christ's return with attitudes of passivity, of acceptance, or bored disinterest. Ah, oh, he's coming. <laughs> Instead, we are to eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he means by that, that we are not to be waiting for an event, but we're waiting for a person. Amen. When the sky, sky cracks open, that's the part. See, the hope of Christ's return provides believers with motivation and accountability and security. Do you know we need all three of those? Motivation, accountability, and security. In this promise, there is a positive motivation to be found faithful when he returns to reward his believers. <sighs> to be accountable to God for living lives that produce gold and silver and precious stones instead of wood, hay, and straw. Amen. Come on now. Finally, the promise of Christ returned, re returned provides security since Jesus promised these words in John chapter 6, verse 39 to 40. He says this. This is the will of him who sent me that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my father and that everyone who who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. See, I'm talking about reaching for the prize this morning. And it's in verse 21a. We're getting ready to close this out. This is good, though. Paul now tells us to look for our prize. And listen to what the prize is. Who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. You know these old knees, Sean? Ain't going to have to worry about them no more, baby. This back part, oh, it's going to be gone. See, Paul reminds us that Christ's return marks the end of our struggle, struggling pursuit of the elusive prize of spiritual perfection. Because, see, for it is then that he will transform the body of our humble estate into conformity with the body of his glory. Somebody needs to say something. And so Paul writes in Romans that we groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for our redeemed body. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 23. It says this. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Ooh, that, that's, oh, that's. You see, here's the thing. I want you to get the picture that's showing in my head. It's the combination of a redeemed spirit and a glorified body. Do y'all see that part? will enable all believers to perfectly manifest the glory of God to the highest somebody needs to say something. And so here's the deal. Because sin, weakness, sorrow, disappointment, pain, suffering, doubt, fear, temptation, fate, hate, and failure will give way to perfect joy. All the things that hold us back and hurts us now will give way to perfect joy. Because salvation involves far more than mere deliverance from hell. God's ultimate goal in redeeming believers is to transform our bodies into conformity with the body of his glory. You see, we will become conformed to the image of his son. This is Romans 8, 29, where he says, For those who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You see, our transformed bodies will allow us to finally be the perfected creation God intended for us to be and have the joy of perfect fellowship with him forever. You see... Is that not a motivation? And it's in verse 21b that Paul goes on and tells us by what means our bodies will be changed. Listen to this. He says, by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. And so what Paul's point is, is that if Christ can subject the entire universe to his sovereign control, then he has the power to transform our bodies into his image. 
And as we run this spiritual Christian race, we must look to godly examples for inspiration and instruction. But here's one step further. We also have to be godly examples and inspiration and instructions ourselves. That's the key. We must also look out for those enemies of the truth who would lead us astray. Amen. Truth counts. Truth matters, and it's always his truth. And finally, as we close, we must focus on the glorious hope that is ours at the return of Christ. See, this is eternal life, holy glory, and joy, unspeakable joy. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, we thank you for another beautiful time in your word, God. I pray that all that was shared here this morning was acceptable in thy sight. God, it's a, it's, it's a tall order. And I know that you are able to do all things but fail. And you've never asked us or commanded us to do anything that you have not already prepared for us to be able to do in you. And so even now, Master, we prepare our hearts and minds to leave this place but never your sight. Father, we're asking that you would continue to go before us, lead us and guide us, keep us in perfect peace until we should come together again. God, we also ask for an indwelling, heaping portion of your Holy Spirit. Give us that dunamis. Give us that power. Give us that desire and that hunger to want to live a life for you and to be useful in your service every day that there is breath in, in our body. And even now, God, as we prepare our hearts and minds to leave this place but never your sight, we're asking, God, that, that you would just uh, bless us. And we ask these blessings, Father, in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name. And the body of Christ says together, amen. amen and amen. God bless you guys. Continue to wear your mask. Use your hands. I know the rules are kind of flexing and loosening and so forth and all that good kind of stuff. But just be safe, be mindful, and be respectful. Bless you. Love you. See you soon. Take care.